Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here on a session that is very close to my heart, uh, the economics of gender parity. We've been running a campaign on CNBC TV 18 uh, in India called Future Female Forward because we truly believe that we need to create equal opportunity workplaces and the kind of potential that you could unleash by involving women in the workforce and more women in the workforce could have a massive positive impact. In fact, that is what the World Economic Forum's data and research suggests as well. But just for the context of why we are discussing this here at the World Economic Forum's 54th annual meeting here in Davos is because progress has stalled when we talk about gender parity. So let's bring up that slide for you to tell you where we currently are. While there has been a move back to the pre-pandemic levels, if you look at us, we're still 131 years away from uh, being able to achieve gender parity, and that tells you just how complex and how challenging the issue is. Uh, there's a whole host of macroeconomic challenges that uh, political leaders, business leaders are dealing with, and so guess what? Gender parity is not on the priority list at this point in time, but it should be because that slide tells you why it could add 12 trillion to global GDP and boost the economic output of some countries, some economies, by almost 35%. So it's not just the fair thing to do, it's not just the right thing to do it is the smart business thing to do it is the smart economic thing to do so without further ado let me introduce our panelists to you here joining us on stage Gabriela Sommerfield the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Human Mobility of Ecuador thank you very much for joining us also with us Mike Henry Chief Executive Officer of the BHP Group Mike great to have you and Annette Mossman Chief Executive Officer of the APG Group uh, uh, coming in from Netherlands thank you very very much just before we got started uh, we were having a conversation in the green room and you know it was odd that each one of us said that we didn't believe that we needed quotas or reservation or mandates to improve uh, the participation of women whether it was boardrooms or uh, you know across the workplaces and yet we've all changed our minds on that so Mike I'm going to start by getting you and Annette to comment on that why why did you change your mind about the need for that so the story I was relaying on was that um, so I, I lead BHP um, world's largest mining company, workforce of about 80,000 people. And I came to, to the company back in 2003, and I joined the company for its values. And, and the leadership then was very focused on a whole range of issues, but including, included doing right by the world, and, and, and one aspect of that was achieving gender parity or increasing female participation in the workforce. Well, fast forward to 2016, and we really hadn't made that much progress in spite of a whole bunch of leaders whose values were in the right place and who had invested genuine uh, uh, effort in this. And you know, the global mining industry is probably about 10 to 15 percent female participation in the workforce. BHP was sitting at the time at about 16 to 17 percent. And we hadn't moved the needle over 10, 12, 12 years. Well, my predecessor as CEO came out in 2016 and said, by 2025, we will have a gender balanced workforce. Uh, he made that a very clear internal target, but also announced it externally um, and held leaders to account around it. So it wasn't a negotiable, it wasn't something that got deprioritized in the face of cost pressures. We were expected to, uh, to progress towards gender uh, uh, equity, gender parity in, in, in BHP, and we were also expected to uphold all of the other things that you would expect a large publicly listed company like BHP to be delivering in terms of uh, uh, profitability, uh, other aspects of social value. And that, bringing that tension to bear in the organization, suddenly unlocked performance. And, and seven years later, six, seven years later, we've increased from 16, 17% to 35%. Uh, my leadership team is fully gender balanced. We've increased uh, uh, female representation on the board. And lo and behold, along the way, company performance has improved. So we're delivering more reliable uh, operational performance, better f financial performance, and overall better uh, safety along that, uh, that way. So I've become a convert, strong <laughs> supporter of needing to put firm uh, uh, targets in place within organizations in order to stimulate the right focus, uh, urgency, and effort to, to achieve the outcome. Uh, Annette, I want you to comment on that. But before that, let me just welcome to the panel Dr. Sri Mulyani Indravati, the Minister of Finance of Indonesia. Thank you very much and welcome to the panel. Annette, over to you on why you changed your mind on why it's important to set a target and be held accountable to it. Yeah, maybe why I was against targets and quota. That was uh, a decade ago. And uh, that was why I believed, and that's pretty naive, we can do it on ourselves from, uh, from a female point of view. Uh, we can do it on ourselves, and, and the numbers are clear, macroeconomic, business numbers, that it is working, diversity, not only through the gender, but also cultural aspects and social aspects is working. So I thought, 
if we really are running a business, it will work out and we don't need uh, quota and targets. Uh, but the, the, the numbers here are also clear. We do need them. Uh, to, to, to do the intervention, clear targets, no excuses. Um, so targets on turnover and profits, but also on diversity to improve future profits. Absolutely. But let me get the two uh, uh, policy leaders here on the panel to comment on what you are individually doing. And uh, Ms. Summerfield, I'll start by asking you, because you've put in place a purple law in Ecuador, which hopes to bring in parity across uh, different sectors. Explain to us the reason why you felt this was important, why you felt you needed to do it, and what you hope to fix with this. Well, it, it will be very important, uh, firstly, to mention what um, my colleagues were just saying and mentioning, and, and, this, and mention also to the statistics you just saw, uh, what it means, uh, this parity for Latin America is 2.6 trillion. And what that means for Ecuador economy is 46 billion. So it's so important to bring this uh, uh, gender parity to, to our countries and to our lives uh, for more productivity and a better economy for everybody. But what Ecuador has been doing, firstly, we created a minister, a new minister, who takes care about uh, women and who takes care about violence and who is um, looking after uh, education capacities for women mm -hmm. and also uh, access for uh, uh, for financing which is uh, which is very important and for technology that's very important for to start in order to start changing a uh, women's life and they to become part of the economy but also we have this new law and the new law was um, was supported by our actual president. He became president after he created and pushed this law through our assembly, like he's, he's kind of a Congress. He is our Congress. So he pushes this law for uh, this purple law. And, uh, and then he became president. And once he became president, what he did it is he practiced what he was willing to do through the law. Uh, the law empowers women, open access to women to different um, important um, cargos, I mean, uh, to, to important places where they can take, women can take decisions and be part of the system in the same level as men. And the first day he became president, half of his ministries are women. Me, uh, I'm part of that uh, statistics. So I don't know how many countries. It, not just a statistic. <laughs> it's much more than a statistic. Okay. <laughs> so, so it, it, how many countries around the world does have the half of the ministries are women? Yeah. And what we can see is that we're working very, very, very hard, and it's we feel just the same. We have the same boys. We we have the, the same empowerment, and it's really great how how the, 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 the dynamics. And another special thing about Ecuador is that the the average age in in the ministries are 40 years. Is yeah. 40 years. Yeah. That means there's a lot of young people that mm -hmm. brings a different dynamic, innovation, a lots of energy. They have a new vision of the new world because we're living in a new world. So this is very important. Through the law, regarding your question, and sorry for all, <laughs> all the things that I talked before, uh, through the law, a, a very important cooperation with privates uh, come to, to, to action. I mean, privates have been working very hard with government to create opportunities for women, mm. to create new jobs for them, to empower them through education, through, uh, through financial access, and, through, uh, and, and, and to technology. So what we're looking is that privates are the ones that are bringing the laws to action to the real world, and that's very important. Well, thank you very much for giving us uh, a sense of what the Purple Law intends to do, as well as sharing your story with us. But let me uh, uh, get uh, Minister Indravati uh, representing Indonesia. And it's, it's good to see emerging economies like India and Indonesia having women finance ministers. So that's something that we, that's an additional commonality that we have. But 
What are the interventions that have taken place that are working to increase the participation of women in the workforce? What's the kind of change that you've seen in economic output in order uh, for this to translate into something that is done at scale? Well, uh, first it's good to be finance minister in which we see quite a lot of now women become finance minister. When I start, it was only me and maybe Christine Lagarde. Now you can see many women become finance ministers. That's changed a lot. In terms of the policy for the Indonesia, we mainstream the gender uh, uh, equality as well as uh, empowering of the gender within our medium term uh, development program. And for finance minister, we also try to put more because if you cannot measure, then you cannot make a progress. That's why within the budget, we are uh, introducing the budget tagging that is uh, identifying whether the budget is really providing a lot of support for the gender. So gender uh, targeting, tag, tagging within the budget is being introduced and, and this is become now to the local government, 42% of our local government. Indonesia is a big country, not as big as India or China, but still big. We have four, 540 provincial, provincial, local and municipality. So 42 now is already introducing budget tag tagging for the gender. Uh, you mentioned about how, because if you look at the woman participation in the labor force in Indonesia, it's still quite stagnant. It is because of both the woman in terms of the skill as well as the opportunity to supply and demand, they have to be addressed both in terms of uh, what is the obstacle for, for these two uh, component of uh, issue. On the supply side, so the government need to use the fiscal tools, including also regulation and policy, to improve the skill of the woman from the very basic, that is Indonesia uh, mortality of the, the delivery of the woman as well as the infant mortality, that's also very close to the woman. This need to be addressed and we allocate quite a lot of budget in terms of the health uh, facility. We also introducing the scholarship. Now, if we look at the higher and uh, scholarship, higher education scholarship, 52% actually enjoyed by the woman. This is to the best university in the world. We also providing uh, all the social safety net program which is based on gender. So for example, like the Family Hope program, this is for the bottom 20% of the family. We are going to pay cash transfer, trans transfer to this household, uh, especially which is headed by women. Mm. This is make sure that they are going to spend this cash transfer for their family rather than, for example, for the head of the whole household with this male, not to offense the male uh, colleague here, but they usually use money for buying a cigarette and so on first rather than for the nutrition of their children. So we also introduce quite a lot of uh, access of capital. So this is on the demand side, uh, how the woman which is mostly working in an informal sector, just uh, our colleague in Ecuador, then we are going to provide uh, access through the subsidized rate of the interest. Mm. Uh, this is especially for the ultra micro, which is more than 7.5 million now have the access, and 90% is actually headed by the woman in this case. So these are all on the supply side in which the woman will be empowered in terms of access of capital, their own skill, opportunity, this is on their supply side. On the demand side, I think there are quite a lot of things that uh, we need to continue promoting through the <laughs> private sector in terms of the policy on diversity, whether on the board as well as employment uh, opportunity. Interestingly, if you look at the Indonesia case, if you look at the education, many of the women or girls, they participating in education. Participation rate is now close or more than 100%. They also academically, the achievement is always better girls than boys, but they are not pursuing career. Many of them drop out, especially because of when they are uh, getting married and have a children. So on the demand side, you have to provide not the gender neutrality, but general affirmation because of the women have a different situation than the men yeah. when they are going to the work or job in this case. So the maternity leave, the uh, lactation place, child care, these are all being introduced. In the Ministry of Finance, I myself, I've already introduced to all my office in the 
many places in Indonesia that they, they have mandatory have the maternity leave, uh, lactation place, childcare, so that we are preventing women to drop out on their early career. And that will allow us to have more women on the top position. No, you're absolutely right in pointing that out. And I think that these, you know, uh, many of the issues that you brought up, these are common across different economies, right. uh, whether it's India or even in the developed world, the lack of maternity leave and so on and so forth are problems or interventions uh, that are much needed. So there are fiscal tools that are monetary tools. And there is, of course, the carrot and stick approach as well, uh, setting accountability, setting targets uh, to, to ensure that we move the needle. But Annette, you know, let me, uh, let me put this question to you because we're talking about economic empowerment as well. Uh, from a you know, venture capital point of view, from a private equity point of view, from a financialization of women point of view, how do we get more women to participate in the financial markets? Uh, how do we get more women to get access to kind of, uh, you know, venture funding to be able to start up if they wanted to? And we're starting to see that happen, but we need a lot more of that to, to go through as well. Yeah, exactly. And, and uh, you're pointing out two things. First, uh, uh, we were discussing that also before. I think it's very important that we uh, we are an investor. We invest 500 billion. Uh, if you look at our portfolio managers, uh, we have a very good system uh, in place. Uh, being you have to look at, of course, uh, risk and return, but also at the the impact side and and how many also the social and uh, gender parity is uh, is part of that. But all those portfolio managers are male, most of them. So we're having a lot of trouble getting portfolio managers in the teams who are evaluating the, invest in the investments. Uh, uh, knowing that, and that's also why I'm saying target. So, uh, what is how can you do it then? From uh, from a point of from our point of view, is what we're doing now, and together with ABP, who is the pension fund, uh, we have 30 million uh, uh, euros. Uh, only for women in the southern part of our world. So we try to encourage entrepreneurship, uh, and I think it's now uh, over 600,000 women and, ch and, and girls helping to set up a business. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is, this is more or less a one-time, not because we don't want to invest more, but it, it, it's taken a lot of time and energy and cost, therefore, to do these investments. But if you look at the performance, it's great. Uh, so we should find our way to navigate more capital uh, towards women entrepreneurs. I think what I do see is uh, uh, what I just said. You don't have that many uh, women uh, portfolio managers, but you do have a lot of private equity funds uh, uh, run by women. Uh, they don't want to work in that culture. Uh, but running into another culture, in their own culture, and they're funding uh, women entrepreneurs. So I think that, that, is, that is very, these are very good initiatives, but at the core, uh, in the places where the big capitals are being navigated towards companies, uh, I think there should change something. Well, speaking of change, and Minister Samafi, let me ask you this, because you've had private sector experience, uh, and now you're, of course, part of the government in Ecuador. What is the ask? What is the hope? What's the expectation from the private sector? How do you believe the government and the private sector can work together? Can there be a convergence to address some of these issues that we just spoke of? Because this underinvestment continues otherwise. Yes, uh, what, what we have to understand, firstly, is what does government do and what does the private sector do? When we understand what's the role of each one, then they, they, are a, they can cooperate because each one has a, def, a different role. Government will mention and, and says which is the policy, which is the regulation, and we'll see that it can land into, into, into action. And private are the ones that will actually do what the country is willing to do. So, so what I can what I can say right now is that it, it is important that there is a good communication and cooperation. When it will fail, when there is no communication, when there is uh, no understanding, what the country wants to do what the role of the private is and what the role of the government is. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. What I'm doing in the, in, in the government after being in the private and what the expect, expectations are is we need to 
working in, in, in another frequency, mentioning that we need to act faster than what we have been doing, and we have to take uh, different, uh, different uh, decisions in order we can develop in a better way. Uh, Ecuador is having a hard time. It's not, it's not part of this, this panel, the, the, what is happening in Ecuador, but it's good to mention that it's having a really hard time, uh, and it, due to security issues, yes. we cannot develop as the way that we need to develop. So I decided, I decided, and, and, and our president decided that we should take another role so we can bring the needs of, from the private to the public. We can uh, put new policies in order we can develop in a better and in a different way that we were doing before and take hard decisions and for taking hard decisions that will impact everybody's mm. uh, in, in, in our country is there's a need to become part and take action also from the public side. It's not easy for the ones that have been in the private always. It's not easy to leave the side of, of, of taking your own decisions at your time, at, 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 at I, at your risk and, and doing the things that you want to do to develop a company. Uh, this is something different. Is what, what we're working for is, is the country, is, is the public side. We're working for others and especially for the most needed ones. Uh, but we need to do that sometimes, sometime, at some time, at some point in our life to make changes better for more people, Absolutely. to become more efficient. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, and it is important for, for you to be able to take the learnings from the private sector, as you said, to bring in more agility and nimble, nimbleness as far as government decision making is concerned, which also includes the decisions around uh, parity. But, you know, Mike, let's talk about the future. Uh, and let's talk about this in the context of the many transitions that we are seeing in the world today, whether it's the energy transition, it's the climate tr transition, uh, and the role that parity or gender parity will play in, in all of this, uh, along with, of course, the changes that we're seeing on account of uh, AI coming in. Uh, you know, as you look at the jobs of the future, what do you do at the design stage to ensure that we do have parity moving forward? Yeah, and, and again, just to set a little bit of the context here, the energy transition is only going to happen with a lot more metals and minerals. So two times as much copper over the next 30 years as the past 30, two ti four times as much nickel, two times as much iron ore, and the list goes on and on. And that extra supply is needing to be met by new mines that are smaller, deeper, more complex. And so the workforce required to, to, to meet that new supply is going to be larger than the workforce of today by some margin. Um, and it's going to be a different skilled workforce because of the development of technology and so on. And, and therefore, the, the challenge for companies like BHP is how do we go about um, uh, staffing up for that, that challenge? Um, and that requires sig significant training. So just to achieve what we've already achieved at BHP, of course, we've changed our recruiting practices. We've opened up flexible work. We've, we've, we've undertaken about eight or 9,000 pay equity reviews um, and so on and so forth. But one of the biggest things that we've done is we've focused on the strategic opportunities to stand up, uh, and coming back to the question about design, to stand up new mines or new investments that we're undertaking on a fully gender balanced uh, um, basis from the get-go. So right now we're deploying about um, $11 billion US into a potash development in Canada. That workforce with production starting in 2026 will be gender balanced from, from, from the start. Um, now, in order to achieve that, of course, we need to look at equipment design, work practices, the culture that we're establishing, um, and, and we need to invest heavily in, in training. If I then come back to the, the point around the energy transition, because the energy transition is going to require a lot more metals and minerals, there's an op a macro opportunity there for industry and governments to be working together in a way that capitalizes on that opportunity to establish uh, a more balanced workforce, um, that shares uh, the value created by these investments on a more equitable basis. And that's, uh, uh, we're talking here about the context of, of gender uh, equity, but of course the same thing applies to how we think about the, the uh, value that gets created for the communities that surround these mining developments as well. And in a world where societal tolerance of inequitable sharing of value has gone way down, and their ability to take action uh, when, when, when they're frustrated by the way things are playing out has grown, I think it's increasingly important for our industry, and there's a lot of work underway around this, to ensure that when we are accessing new resources and developing those mines, we do so in a way that's sustainable, that creates greatest possible value for, the, for, for, for all stakeholders involved, 
um, and in the case of gender equity, to ensure that we really pay attention to how we go about opening up opportunity, equal opportunity for women in these developments, and to ensure that the uh, mines are, are developed with a, a gender balanced workforce. Uh, Minister Indravati, let me put that question to you since we're talking about economic opportunities that are opening up. And I ask you this in the context of the supply chain de-risking and diversification that's underway currently, uh, of which a country like Indonesia is also a beneficiary. So how are you at the design stage ensuring that across manufacturing you open up you know, more jobs for women, that you do have gender balance across the workforce? Uh, are there measures that the government is trying to put in place along with the private sector to ensure that? Well. Um I think in terms of the the woman is in terms of the labor force, I don't see that this is really a problem of the woman to get opportunity to have a skill or in this case training uh, to be able to that assume this responsibility. At least uh, there is no discrimination on that. It's more the discrimination is because naturally they are going to drop off. So the trait of of the time allocated for the woman to continue pursue career and have a family is become a real big issue for the Indonesia. And that's really need to be addressed. But apart from that, uh, from the government point of view, policy and regulation is very important. Making sure that the signaling of providing the equal opportunity is really there. Or even in this case, it's not just general neutral. Because general neutral, maybe it sounds good, but not really good enough for women because you are in an asymmetric world at this very moment. So you really have to tilt the balance more, less neutral or more affirmative uh, for, the, for the gender. But I would like to say that uh, the manufacturing is one thing for the Indonesia. Informal sector is more dominated by the woman. On the formal sector, why it is uh, informal sector dominated by women? My guess is not only just the opportunity which is limited, but also because with the informal sector, you have more flexibility yeah. in terms of the time that you can manage between your own, that is family, as well as the job. And then I would like to link with your previous question in terms of the digital economy and AI. I believe that this can democratizing and providing more empowerment for the woman. After the pandemic, a lot of work has been actually using the digital technology. And Indonesia investing quite a lot on a hard infrastructure as well as soft infrastructure. In this case, this has become a very important moment, momentum for the woman. Women now feel that, oh, I can do still the job uh, uh, at home, but also having access both on a capital as well as market, or even in terms of the skill. Because we providing, for example, during this pandemic, pre-employment card. This is for those who's already unemployed during the pandemic. We provide cash transfer and also training. Out of 17 million, again, 51% are participated by the women. And that's showing that they are maybe heavily affected due to the pandemic yeah. more to the women's side. But also at the same time, they see the new opportunity with this digital technology that I can overcome this the asymmetric impact of this pandemic. So we really see this digital economy as one that can create a different momentum for the woman. And that's why data protection is important. In, in this yeah. case, all the regulation, which is making sure that they are going to be able to enjoy this benefit of digital technology without suffering from the downside risk. I think that's going to be very important. Financial inclusion, financial literacy, access to the capital, that is going to be very important. But if you're talking about the formal sector, as you mentioned, I think we have to really look at the labor market as a whole. For Indonesia, interestingly, if you can see, the first time the association of the employer in Indonesia headed by women. This is the first time in the history of Indonesia. It's always male headed in, uh, in, the, in the previous uh, period. We also have, if you have uh, on energy sector, Indonesia, the biggest SOE on uh, energy is headed, the CEO is a woman. The CFO, also a woman. Electricity company, this is the biggest monopoly, the CFO is also a woman. So these are all a very powerful position, which is going to provide a signal to many, because I will not, I will not underestimate the role model. If they see that a certain position used to be only dominated and taken by men, and now taken by women, and they can perform really well, it's not only inspiring, but motivating many of the girls and women to say that, oh, now I can actually get that one. 
I think on that formal sector, apart from training, skill, and then lessening the threat of on the timing, they also still continue need to have this very effective role modeling. Because for them, what is impossible in the past now become possible. In this is area which is in the past being seen no woman zone now become a woman zone. Well, that is very powerful. I, I think both you, Annette, and of course uh, Minister Summerfield are, are examples of those role models. And, and as is Mike, because you've been able to push the needle and make the change, <laughs> yep. we need both. We need role models yeah. and allies uh, across the spectrum. And, and it's great to have, uh, have each one of you here. But Annette, you know, uh, as you look out into the future now, and especially as far as the financial markets are concerned, uh, the business that you're a part off, what are the changes that you believe we need to make to ensure that we will see better representation? You talked about the lack of portfolio managers. It's not a skill issue uh, necessarily. What's, what do you believe will be the key interventions that we need to prioritize as of today? It's not, not well, for my part, it's not always one intervention. There will be more. I think we, we talked about a lot, uh, um, creating the circumstances for women. Um, I think, uh, as, as you said, that digitalization is, is a real opportunity. And history showed that if you can't bring the work a bit closer to home, women participation is increasing. We did that during agricultural yes. times. So why did women participation decrease? That was because work went out of the home. And I think also one other thing is, uh, I call it, all, it's not about time. I know in a career where women get... Uh, uh, children and more caretaking job uh, activities. Uh, it's the flexibility. Uh, it's not really the time, but the flexibility which you need. Uh, so for employers, uh, it's very important to realize that, give an opportunity to work from home and, and the flexibility from a trust point of view that work is to be done. That can't always be done in certain sectors, I, I admit. But I think that these are also very important. Um, and from my point of view, 50% of our board is female, so I strongly, also strongly believe in, in uh, role modeling, but also the pipelines, filling the pipelines with talents and keeping them. That, and uh, I, I always say female leadership is, is a question for men and women. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so it should be fostered, uh, female talents should be fostered by men. And uh, uh, we're different, and that is our strength because that's why you have diversity. But that means at certain times that we don't raise our hands or we need a little push or we need, need, uh, it need to be uh, approached in a different way. So like we do, do in leadership program, unconscious bias, uh, um, and making very clear where the differences are and you can break that through. Uh, so there, there are on, on a lot of fields, uh, in the public, in the private, and as investor, I think uh, what we're doing um, next to climate, but put, putting the real good governance and, and, and uh, the, the, the right um, uh, mix of uh, and diversity into boards and also in all the teams as, as, a, as, a, as a real target and a key KPI as a key target and a key KPI and you know we were talking about technology and and uh, biases and just yesterday I was talking to a tech CEO who was talking about how they're using technology now to deal or address with uh, address some of these unconscious biases especially at the hiring level and perhaps we will see a lot more of that uh, as uh, as we move through the process of more digitization but I think we have a few moments now if we could open this up for questions if we do have uh, Yes, we do have a couple of hands up here. Uh, if you can get a microphone here to the lady in the orange, and then I'll come to the gentleman at the back. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Mia Perdomo. I'm the CEO of iQualis. We measure and consult companies in Latin America to have gender equality and diversity conditions. And um, we created a ranking because we discovered that companies like competing against each other, which is fine. So we decided if that's the way they're going to go to gender equality, then that would be it. And that's how we got 2,000 to compete. However, uh, there are many other corporations that go under the radar, which are SMEs or are even informal, that aren't even registered. And I was wondering, how you think that we can tackle that. I know that some of you can work in government, others don't, 
But even for big corporations, it's hard to get their supply chain to go into our ranking mm -hmm. because they're smaller and because they have other sort of policies. So uh, how do we go further into all sorts of corporations and informal work so that they have policies and practices that lead to gender equality? Thank you. Mike, would you like to take that? So we would, would, would love to because, of course, it's something that we focus on as, uh, as well. Just like in the case of climate change, we focus on um, carbon emissions in the full uh, supply chain and we stimulate through the commercial contracts that we put in place action both upstream and, and downstream from the business. It's the same on gender equality. Um, and so we track the, uh, or we, we try to, to um, stimulate through our commercial agreements and frankly through the um, conversations that we have at a CEO to CEO level or further down in our respective organizations a focus on um, uh, increasing female participation in the suppliers to, to, to BHP. Just last week, I had a, you know, one of our, our, our partners uh, pitching to me all the work that they've done for BHP over the course of the past year and talking about the work that we go, might do together. Well, the final section of their report was all on what they're doing internally to increase female uh, participation and female representation in the client-facing roles that they, they, they have, as, uh, and, they're, and they're a big global firm. Uh, but we do that at all levels with all sorts of organizations. Now, getting them into a ranking, that wasn't, I wasn't uh, uh, aware of the, the, the ranking that you're speaking about, but that's something that I'm sur sure we would be willing to engage on to see if that's something that we can reinforce through the contracting uh, strategies that, that, uh, that we adopt. Yes, please. Maybe from a European perspective, uh, I think we, I'm not calling for more legislation, but uh, the new European laws like CSRD, it's, it's about double materiality and it's the responsibility uh, for, for you as a company to follow up the complete chain. Mm. Uh, so we will get that in place in two years time in Europe. Uh, so we have to look at the chain and also along this perspective. So uh, sometimes uh, we, we were talking about targets and quota, but also here sometimes legislation helps yes. to take that responsibility as a company, not only for your own uh, activities and what you're doing, but also for the complete chain. Absolutely, and, and help out the ecosystem that you work with as well. Uh, yes, go ahead, sir. We'll just get a microphone across to you. Perfect. Hello, my name is Robert Beamish. I'm a global shaper from the Ottawa Hub. Thank you. I'm really glad to hear, especially from the financial sector and the mining sector, which are traditionally male-dominated industries. And we talked a lot about the quantitative side of gender parity. I'm really curious about the qualitative side around how we go once we have gender parity, we have more women in the workforce, how we build that environment around preventing harassment, around building retention, and the benefits that come with that. As well, I'm very curious, Mr. Henry, your, what you see as the role of uh, male allyship in building gender parity. So if I can re respond to that question. Yes. I think the, the first point that you made around um, the environment that we create, I don't believe that you can achieve uh, um, a balanced workforce without addressing the factors that you've mentioned. You can make some progress, but you will fall backwards very quickly. It will manifest itself as higher turnover attrition for, uh, the, for the, the, the females in, in the workforce. So one of the metrics that we track very closely is male attrition versus female attrition. And we started off with female attrition being about double males in the workforce, and we've brought that down to parity through a lot of work on culture. Now, some of that is simply through, through the, the way that people relate to each other on a day-to-day -day basis, making that more inclusive. But there are some really hard um, and, and um, uh, unacceptable behaviors that have occurred in the mining industry in the past and frankly occur outside the, across all industries. We've had line of sight on that and have taken very firm steps, including increasing camp security, because oftentimes with mine sites, people are working in remote uh, locations, setting very clear behavioral standards, uh, putting in place uh, formal um, investigative uh, teams internally, such that when complaints are made, those get followed up with a formal investigation, they can be uh, actioned. So all of that needs to come in lockstep with the focus on creating a more balanced uh, uh, workforce. And um, that's been a, one of the reasons that we've been successful. Um, I don't think we'd be where we are today if not for having um, uh, uh, focused on that. Yes, there's a question right there. If you can stand up and get me the microphone. 
Thank you so much, panel, and very heartening stories about how the diversity efforts are going in the right direction. My question is, there's also a new narrative that is coming up, and especially in the United States, about uh, DEI and these aspects being challenged, and you see at least in the academic institutions and many other corporations about woke, woke capitalism and diversity. Uh, so with that challenge, uh, how do you see that uh, coming into uh, other aspects, and do you think diversity is challenged, and uh, if it is, uh, what is our role in that? Annette, would you like to take that, or the ministers? Yeah. I would like to yeah. take that. Sure. Um, I'm not sure, yeah, um, you're talking from an American perspective, I'm not, I'm not um, very clear on what's happening there, but I, I think diversity is challenged, um, and, uh, Especially when you look in Europe uh, with all the uh, more popular uh, uh, and polarization, more popular political parties and, and uh, polarization, I do think. But I, I have such a strong belief uh, that the answer uh, is also in in the diversity, uh, the complexity of the problems we're having. If you talk about climate, the polarization, uh, all the wars, I think diversity is the answer to a complex problem. Um, so it is challenged, and maybe we should uh, step up uh, and step uh, lean in more often, but I think it's the only way out for this world. Well, yes, there is always a challenge for this diversity because you change something which is already commonly adopted uh, and norm, and that's why it is very important to continue making this dialogue and, uh, and conversation. To be very honest, whether you are coming from the religious, uh, mm. cultural, or any of those the social norm, they are still there. And if you go and pushing a change, there will be always a reaction, and there is always a also setback in this case. So I'm not uh, commenting on the U.S. politics and those uh, discussion, but in many other society, there will always a setback, and that's why uh, breaking the glass uh, rule is very very important because then you see that what is impossible before it's become possible now. It is not sacrificing the quality as asking by the gentleman in this case, but you are just making a change which in the past for many of the women and girls it is impossible and now become possible. Well, yes, I I'm going to give you the, the last word. Uh, Mike, go ahead. So, it, it, and this is perhaps a business CEO perspective, but for us this has all been about the business case. And it, it's been very clear that when we pursued this it was because we believed it would lead to better business performance. And that's exactly what we've seen happen. And it kind of goes to the, the question raised by the gentleman earlier about well, what's changed by way of your, your culture and the practice that you have in place. In order to create or to, to increase female participation in the workforce, we've needed to create a more inclusive culture. That more inclusive culture has unlocked the potential of both women and men in the workforce. Mm. It's brought more creati creativity to the fore. That has led to better underlying business performance. And we've seen it in our ability to, to operate more reliably uh, and to deliver better results than the industry average over that period of, of time. So the business case to me is strong at a corporate level, let alone the, 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 the higher order economic opportunity that you flagged earlier. Well, I think that is the perfect note to end this conversation because I think it links back to where we started, that there is the perfect case for us to move forward as governments, as organizations, as individuals to push for, uh, for greater parity across each of the sectors that we operate in. Uh, thank you so much for sharing very real, tangible insights on what you've done within your organizations, within your governments to try and change things. Change is hard. It takes time, but it also requires tremendous amount of commitment passion and of course purpose as well so uh, we look forward to hearing more from each one of you and thank you so much uh, for sharing your stories and for asking some very important and interesting questions here to take the conversation forward once again thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for joining us here this afternoon thank you, thank you.